but I'm Joe Cotrufo, Executive Director of Bike Houston. Thank you so much for joining us today. I can't tell you how excited I am about today's keynote. And I think from this session today, you'll see that Houston's challenges when it comes to becoming a really bike-friendly city, our challenges really aren't so unique, even compared to some European cities. Uh, before we move on, I'd like to thank our co-presenters, Houston B-Cycle and Link Houston. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors, uh, Traffic Engineers Inc., Edo Bike Co., Darrow, and Bike Barn for their support. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Gail DeLauter, transportation reporter with Houston Public Radio. Um, Gail will introduce today's keynote speaker. Gail? Well, thank you so much, Joe, and thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier before we started the session about the work that we do at Houston Public Media, the transportation coverage that we do. And I would have to say that bikes are probably the, get the biggest response of anything that we do on the transportation beat. A lot of the response that we get and a lot of the coverage kind of follows along the same themes. People in Houston really want to ride, but they're frustrated by some things that we have in the infrastructure right now, the lack of connections from one bike route to another, and then also the frustrations of riding on the street and not always having a designated and safe place where you can ride safely alongside vehicular traffic. So this afternoon, we're going to talk about what some other cities around the world have done to meet bike challenges and to make their cities more bike friendly and, and in a really, really big and a really, really rapid way to meet transportation challenges. Our keynote speaker this afternoon is Manuel Calvo. He is a socio-ecologist and senior consultant at a Studio MC. He comes to us this afternoon from Seville, Spain. And he's carried out several plans to improve mobility and accessibility for both cyclists and pedestrians. Now, the plan he's going to talk about with us this afternoon and the plan a lot of people are familiar with is a rapid implementation of a bike network in Seville, Spain. Calvo has also published work on the ecological footprint of cities and best practices in municipal bike policies. Calvo also speaks on sustainable mobility and he's taught courses on economics and the environment at the University Pablo de Olavide in Spain. So welcome to Houston, Manuel Calvo. Thank you very much, Gail. Thanks, Joe, for having me here today. Uh, well, uh, I'm uh, going to talk to you, talk to you uh, of my experience, actually. I uh, experienced that we started in 2003 in Seville, Spain, and the title says it all. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm going to try to uh, give you uh, a sense of what we did uh, from that year about the emergence of cycling in Seville. Uh, actually, it's very important that we improved uh, cycling mobility and that was, there was a political will to do so. I mean, and also a technical will to do so. We did not have any cycling culture at the moment. Uh, I think it's a really, really good uh, starting point in order to tell you what we did in Seville because maybe you're in Houston are uh, suffering the same situation that we had in Seville back in, in, in 2004. So where is Seville? First of all, Seville is a city that is located in Southern, Western, Southwestern uh, Europe in southwestern Spain, really close to Africa and to Morocco. And we have a Mediterranean weather. And that means that it gets really hot in the summertime. So it's just the same as Houston, as I've been told. Uh, so it's located there on a river basin. It's eight meters uh, high from the sea level. And there you have the central city, the Guadalquivir River that structures the city and goes north, south. This is the central city and the metropolitan area. And we are talking about a city that it's about 1.5 million inhabitants right now. The central city uh, holds uh, half of that people. We are talking about 700,000 people in the central city. And everything that I'm going to talk to you about happened in the central city. We are trying to do the same on the whole metropolitan area, but it's going slow. Uh, 
everything that happened that I'm going to talk to you today is happening actually in the central city. Uh, the, there you have the central city and it has a really a peculiar urban form, globular urban uh, form, and it's got the third biggest historical district in Europe. Uh, and that conforms the, his, the history, the urban history of the city. Uh, it's a really important space in the city, and it's got uh, about 1.2 miles of diameter, north to south and west to east. And it's this uh, spot that you see here. And around, as you can see, there's the uh, 20th century developments and urban developments that conforms the whole city right now, as I told you, 700,000 inhabitants. Uh, first of all, I would like to also tell you that we have a non-existent biking culture. I mean, there were no bikes in Seville at all. Uh, it's a Mediterranean city. Uh, it's not Netherlands. It's not Copenhagen. It's not Denmark. We here, we do, we, we, we did, and we still do have a high consideration of cars, a socioeconomic status indicator. Uh, of course, we've been planning and urban, making urban planning devoted to cars and to car mobility for the last century or at least uh, six decades and uh, a high raising of car mobility from the 80s. I mean, this is a situation that I'm sure is not surprising for you. I mean, it's, uh, it's almost the uh, same situation as you have there in Houston and in many, many other uh, American cities. Uh, but I would also tell you that and this is picture is taken in the beginning of the 20th century where the bike was used in the city as well as all over the world. I mean, the bike was a really used transportation on the late uh, 19th century and the beginnings of the uh, 20th century. So uh, what we are talking about actually it's to recover something good that we had at that point and to make it of course modern or, or adapt that mobility to modern times but i always uh, tell people that actually the bikes uh, have been all around since back uh, uh long ago this is the model share in seville uh here you can see the evolution of the uh walking and cycling from the 80s to uh, the last reliable data that we have in 2007. As you can see, uh, the model share of walking has been going down. And in the parallel way, the uh, uh, cars, the car mobility is going up. So actually the evolution that has happened in the last four decades here in, in Spain, only in Seville, and I could say also in Europe or even in America and the United States or Canada, it's that lots of walking trips and trips that were made by a non-motorized means of transportation have been changing to our car mobility. It's not a matter of losing from a public share system to car mobility, but, but from non-motorized means of transportation to, uh, to cars. Well, this was the situation of the central city back in 2004 and 2005. Of course, we did have several bike lanes. Here, as you can see, with the uh, green lanes here, uh, disconnected, not useful actually for bike mobility, located in the surroundings of the urban space and not in the real uh, city. But uh, right now, the situation is this one. I'm gonna show you several pictures of cycling, of cyclists in Seville that use the bike on a daily basis to get to point from point A to point B. I mean, we're not talking about people doing sports or using the bike on a leisure uh, way. We are talking people that are normal people not cyclists, normal people using the bike on a daily basis. 
here you can see a woman, a man, probably going to work or going to the university, the elderly that use the bike in order to, uh, you know, to go around in the city with the dogs. Parking facilities all full of people taking on parking bikes. Do you know, as you can see there, normal people waiting for the traffic lights, crossing the streets, waiting in the intersections, using the bike, not for a sport, but to go to sport, to do some sports. Normal people, no helmets, for example, normal gear, wearing, you know, trousers or jackets or whatever. This is, for example, a rush hour on a really, uh, on a point here in the, on the network here in Seville. So you can see lots of people, women, men, children, families getting around. This is, for example, a Sunday to go to. So you can see here, we have a traffic jam of bikes, the traffic light. Women are taking their children to school on cargo bikes. The moons <laughs> and the Catholic church using also the bike. And people wearing you know, jackets and ties going to work using the bikes in order to get around. Mm -hmm. Waiting for a parking spot there. Here in this uh, uh, parking uh, facility on a train station, on a metro line, on a workplace, all full of bikes. I mean, people that are using the bike in order to go to work, in order to go to school, in order to go to the university, in order to go shopping, in order to go to the park, to get around, basically. So, uh, well, uh, what we did in Seville is to apply some strategies. Uh, the first of all was cycling to understand the cycling as a non-motorized means of transportation. Uh, always trying to make the urban context more sustainable. Of course, writing a master plan. And we developed also a special concept about cycling infrastructure. And I'm gonna talk more about this in a moment. This meant that first of all, and very, very important, in order to make bike infrastructure, we had a network concept. I mean, the concept, the real infrastructure was not a bike lane, was not a bike track, was not getting that bike lane into a street or an avenue. The project was to make and to build a network, a network that had or, uh, uh, or gave us continuity in order to make cycling comfortable and useful to get around. That infrastructure had to be uniform and recognizable because it was a new infrastructure in the city. So it was really important that that new infrastructure that was coming to the city could be recognizable by everyone. Had to be direct without any detours or unuseful detours because it had to be fast also, the infrastructure and the cycling mobility. And this is also really important along main avenues and streets. On the residential areas or secondary streets, we thought that the best strategy there was traffic calming and not separation of infrastructure. So the main corridors, the mobility corridors that the people were using on the daily basis, they had to be also the corridors where to place the bike infrastructure. What we applied in Seville was that strategy. And what we did was the first phase consisted in building a complete and a single and as a single project, the whole network. I mean, we designed, and I'm gonna show you a, an image 
uh, in a few minutes. What we designed was a whole network, what we call the first phase of 80 kilometers, about 60 miles. And what we did was uh, building that basic network at the same time and really fast in just two years. And that was, I think that is the main lesson that we learned in Seville. I mean, building a network slowly with pieces and then connect those pieces and getting in the process like 10, 15 or 20 years, that does not work. What we did in Seville was to build that basic and complete network as a single project and really, really, really fast. We built also a bi-directional path at sidewalk level. More images in a minute. Mainly on previous road surface, really important also. Actually, we took the space of around 4,000 parking spaces for cars. We, of course, uh, included in the master plan that we wrote coordinated policies not only on infrastructure with, but on many, many other issues involved on cycling developments. And we uh, uh, also mm, conformed or formed a uh, sort of a space where the civil society and the participation was possible in order to get the opinions of all those people that were reclaiming actually by infrastructure and uh, uh, bike promotion uh, policies. Here, as you can see, uh, what we did in Seville, this is like the model of the infrastructure that we built at that moment. Here you can see an avenue with it, three traffic lanes and uh, a parking space. These cars were parked besides the trees in the first moment. So we took that space to a traffic lane. And in that space that was empty, we placed the uh, bike lane there at sidewalk level. Uh, I could give you some reasons why we did it at sidewalk level. So, uh, but uh, I think it would be better if I uh, go forward and then in the discussion, maybe we can discuss that, that uh, issue. Um, here you can see another image. Here we, we, what we did was to widen the platform or the sidewalk and then place the infrastructure on top. So this was previous parking spaces. The, the, this space was previous parking spaces. So we took that from the road. We also got that space here. You can see a bike lane that is, uh, was placed in road uh, level. So we took that space from uh, getting uh, not that wide lanes, traffic lanes. We, 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 went, we uh, took that space from the traffic lanes. And this is the uh, work where it all started. It was, written, it was written in 2004. And this was the design of the uh, first phase, what we call the basic network at the moment. Uh, it was built, it was 80 kilometers uh, long, and it is actually 80 kilometers long, and we did that in only uh, one and a half or two years. So by 2007, 2008, this was uh, the whole network. I would like you to compare the situation in 2005 and 2008, 2007, 2008. It's, it's no comparison possible. I mean, we did that in just two and a half years. Uh, and after that, another 40 kilometers were built by 2010. And right now the situation in the city is this one. This is the whole cycling infrastructure, as I told you, in the central city. As you can see on the historical district, there are no bike lanes because there are, it's a medieval historical district and it's got really narrow uh, streets. So traffic calming works better there. And also traffic calming works better on the residential areas. Here in this, inside these spots, this square and this uh, big apples, you can, you can call them. Uh, this, uh, picture, these are pictures about the uh, before and after. 
So you can see there, we placed the bike lane here in previous road space, the before and after parking spaces, before and after parking spaces, before and after. Here you can see some uh, two pictures of before and after and what it's being done right now. As you can see here, we uh, had the uh, curb here. So we widened the uh, sidewalk and we placed the bike lane. And right now we have given that space to the pedestrians and we have built uh, another more uh, wider bike lane actually on either, even more road space. That's like the, uh, the second time. I mean, the, uh, this, this has been improved here in this uh, particular point twice in the uh, last 15 years. The strategy, of course, is take space from the cars, even more space from the cars. And so you can see the same. 2003, 2007, and 2020. Uh, back in 2007, also a bike sharing scheme was placed uh, in the city uh, where we had uh, stations uh, all over the city. And this was also made at the same time. I mean, we placed 250, uh, 250 stations and 2,500 bikes in just six months or one year. Mm -hmm. So we did not, we, we followed the same strategy as the infrastructure. We thought that in order the bike, uh, the public bike scheme, in order for it to work, it was really important to have as many stations from the beginning as possible and as many bikes also. Mm -hmm. Of course, there was a backlash. Uh, you can expect that also in Houston. Mm -hmm. You can expect that actually in every other city in the world <laughs> when you get the space from the cars in order to uh, to, to, to have more bikes. Uh, here you can see uh, the head of an article uh, and it says this, the useless bike lane and how to waste millions. Uh, we suffered that backlash during the uh, building of the first phase. That means one and a half or two years. But you know, the numbers just spoke for themselves. This is the number of cycling trips, uh, daily cycling trips on a labor day, mm? on a working day. From 2005, here, you know, not many cyclists. And there was a rise of the number of cyclists to the peak in 2011. Mm? Here, we had uh, four years of a uh, local government that was not supportive of cycling mobility. And we expected that uh, the uh, cycling trips were going to go low, on a, they were, they were going to be in a lower level, but we got a uh, more supportive local government again, and the numbers are beginning to rise again. Uh, now with the scooters that are using also the bike infrastructure, we have more than 80,000 trips in the city uh, in a working day, in a typical working day, and that's a lot for uh, for Spanish environment. I think it's uh, Seville, it's even with Vitoria or, or Barcelona or Valencia, maybe are there four uh, where, where the bikes are more uh, used uh, here in Spain, but the leader uh, has been Sp uh, Seville for, for a long time. Also a study that was uh, done by the university trying to calculate the risk of serious injury where uh, when uh, using the bike, and here you can see that the risk of using the bike has been lowering on the last years. And uh, it, it's, it's been in, in low numbers since we have the infrastructure. So the, uh, you know, the numbers speaks for themselves. So since uh, these numbers and you know, the situation that changed that much, and it was something that was really uh, conspicuous in the city, where you can see lots of people cycling uh, there and all around, we had no uh, more backlash. Now, even the conservative uh, press uh, is uh, understands 
that the bike is a part of, of the urban uh, culture of the, of the city. Right now, we are heading for new programs and new master plans, trying to reach us a 15% of total mobility uh, and taking that number that we uh, showed uh, before from 70,000 uh, trips on a working day on a daily uh, uh, basis uh, to 115,000 uh, daily trips in a working typical working day. Also to start strong promotion policies, including education and social interventions to improve cycling parking uh, policies and improve the intermodality and the, that, the, the, the very important alliance that had to be uh, made between bike and cycling and walking and the uh, transit, transit system and, and public transit uh, and mobility. And uh, also really important that we are not in a phase that where, where or when we need more and more and more uh, kilometers or miles of cycling infrastructure. What we need now is to improve the quality and not the quantity of the network. We have uh, problems in some uh, pieces of the network where we have uh, capacity uh, problems there, traffic jams in, in some intersections in rush hour. So we need to improve definitely the cycling, the quality of the cycling network, and also to improve the legal framework of the of the of cycling, and that's also happening in the whole country in Spain, not only in Seville. So here we have the uh, network right now. The parking spaces here in the street, inside the schools, at the university or the working uh, buildings, the working spaces or the working uh, buildings and places. Here, as I uh, showed you before this image on a traffic of uh, the tram line, this is people using their bikes inside the tram line. Uh, they, are, they are allowed to do so not where in rush hour, but in the spaces between rush hours. Um, people definitely use the, uh, that space and that opportunity to get their bikes into the tram line. This is a tram station inside the tram station. And we are also now trying to improve the bike uh, spaces and the bike parking uh, on the uh, transit hubs. Here is the hub of San Bernardo, where uh, a safe parking uh, slot or, 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 or building have been uh, done, have been, have been made. Uh, to get 250,000 parking spaces uh, on a safe manner. Now that you, you can you can use that to get their bike or your bike to the uh, to the transit hub to park safely your bike there and then uh, use the transit on a safe way. This is these are the proposals in order to make to improve the quality of the network that have been included into the new master plan. And this is some local studies that we are, we've been trying to, uh, to get a better infrastructure to eliminate some detours. Here you can see the, uh, the uh, line that follows the car, the line that follows the tram line, and the line that follows the bike infrastructure, where, where you, can, you have to wait also to several traffic lights in order to make a straight line. So we're trying to improve that that what I mean. That's what I mean. Where when I say that uh, the quality of the infrastructure must be uh, improved. So uh, as my my last sentence, maybe uh, it's, it's really important that it always seems impossible until it's done. And you have to understand that uh, after or before, actually before uh, we did all this or we we began all the all this process. We went around Spanish cities, uh, around European cities, but we, we, we developed what we think it's a unique way of how to improve things really, really fast. As I told you before, regarding uh, cycling infrastructure, it's really, really, really important. Network concept, have a basic network, make it fast. We usually say here that the infrastructure just fell from sky in one and a half years. 
we had lots of backlash. It was really difficult, but it seemed actually impossible to, to do that, but we did it and it's working. People use the bike, people are happy using the bike because it's comfortable and because it's useful. And those are the main characteristics that uh, impulse the bike and the bike usage in a city. Do not wait for people getting ecologically minded. Do not wait for people to use the bike for urban reasons or urban development or, or, or a better quality of life or, or urban space. They use the bike because it's useful and it's comfortable. And we do need infrastructure in order to make that possible and a reality. So thank you very much. I'm open for your questions, of course. Muchas gracias para la gente que habla español. Manuel, thank you very much for your remarks this afternoon. And we've got a lot of really great questions coming in. And one of the, the takeaways that kind of stood out to me, you talk about the political will to do this project, and it seems like you had a lot of political factions sort of playing out, similar to what we see in Houston and other American cities. If you could talk a little bit about that, um, you know, where did the, the lines fall in terms of people in support of bike infrastructure who didn't want it? So how did that all play out in the end? Yeah, well, uh, in 2003, we had local elections here. Um, a coalition, a political coalition was made uh, for the local government. So there was a teeny party uh, that had two people at that moment that were cyclists and used the bike and understood the importance for the city to improve the bike mobility. So they got into the local government and they built the uh, necessary political will in order to do that. To do that. And, uh, you know, it happened actually because there were these two people <laughs> and they managed to, uh, to create uh, an environment where people started to talk about uh, improving cycling mobility. And what they also made was uh, a poll. And as a result of that poll, uh, the people, 90% uh, of the people responded yes at, at the question about is cycling infrastructure something important that the city should have? So 90% of the people responded or answered yes to that question. So with that number, they got to the, they, they went to the mayor and, and they say, okay, uh, you have the opportunity to do that. They had the money and they created the political will and the technical environment. They create immediately a group of people that worked uh, on a daily basis, just dedicated, because it's really, really difficult to make 80 kilometers of bike network in just one and a half years. <laughs> That's really, really, really difficult. So they had a whole team of, te of technicals, of uh, you know, technicians and people that were uh, trying to, to, to make this a reality. And we had a sort of real problems with uh, you know, the paint or how to, how to design the intersections how to get materials because you know in Spain nobody had done anything like this before <laughs> so we we did even have lack of materials in order to build the, the, the network and all sort of problems with related to that issues to those issues so it was really uh, but you know the answer to your question is that it's really and everything starts with the political will and the braveness of some politicians that um, managed to also to handle that backlash that did happen here in Seville. Well, one question we have from one of our participants this afternoon, could you talk more about the decision to place bike infrastructure on major roads um, in terms of maybe taking away lanes for vehicular traffic, taking away parking? So how was that decision made to put routes on major roads and, and how did that play out? Well, uh, we, we did not think uh, really hard about that. I mean, we always understood that the avenues or the main roads are the uh, corridors for, for urban tra transportation and the infrastructure had to be there. 
uh, actually we did nothing more. Uh, you know, there are some people that says, uh, that say that, uh, you know, it's better if you place that infrastructure on the secondary roads where the traffic is low and we have, we don't have that pollu much pollution, for example, it's quieter, but that, 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 that doesn't work because the shops are in the main avenues and the places where people want to go are the same as and the, and the mindset of the people understanding their urban space is like that. I mean, they go through the, the most important uh, transportation corridors. So we just placed the uh, infrastructure there and it worked. Well, another question we have this afternoon, and I'm sure this is a problem in Seville and it, it's pretty much a problem in any city worldwide is distracted driving either from devices or just the other distractions that you have in, in the vehicles, the way they're designed now. So um, how has Spain addressed distracted drivers in terms of interacting with cyclists? And do you think the distracting driving issue is the same in Seville as what you would see here in Houston? Well, actually, I don't know the uh, situation for the issue there you're, you're requesting. Uh, 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 is about Gail because I don't know the situation in Houston. Of course, we have issues here of distracting drivers with the GPS or the mobile phones or the cell phones or whatever. Uh, I guess, and I'm guessing because I'm, I'm not an, an expert on handling um, distractions in the driving sense. Uh, I guess that uh, that's why we, we understood that it was really, really, really important that the infrastructure had to be uniform and recognizable, not only for the people that were going to use it, but for the people that were not going to use that infrastructure. People always have to understand that there is a bike infrastructure there. And that's, that, that's why uh, we made the decision back in 2003 and 2004 to paint the whole infrastructure. I mean, it's green after you've seen it in the images. But right now, the new improvements of the quality, because we're widening the bike lanes right now in, uh, in lots of places, they're, they're not being painted anymore because we don't need it anymore. Because the infrastructure and cycling and, and the bikes are all over the place. So people understand that they have to care also, not just for the pedestrians, not just for the red lights or for the buses or for other cars but also for cyclists. Even because we have a really impressive figure, uh, around 20% of the people in Seville use the bike in one way or, not, or other, but it's been also an explosion of bike usage in many ways in Seville. So it's really probable that the people that are driving also use the bike. And if not them, their children, their cousins, their parents, or whatever. Yeah, that's a problem we have here in Houston, and I'm sure a lot of folks out there are going to be nodding in agreement right now, is there still seems to be a lack in terms of educating people here in Houston about what a bike lane is, how it's supposed to work. We hear stories all the time about cars driving into bike lanes, just not respecting that as bike infrastructure or parking in bike lanes. That's a huge problem we see downtown in particular. So what was the education component and what was the enforcement component to change people's mindsets? It's like, look, this is the way it is now. This is a bike lane. This is how it's used. So how do you just change people's mindset in terms of interacting in a different kind of infrastructure? Well, I can, I have to tell you, uh, Gail and the uh, people who are uh, listening to us that we made lots of mistakes and we learned a lot in this process and we developed a sort of know-how on how to design bike infrastructure. And that's not easy because uh, th that's not taught on the university or in other other places. I mean, um, so the design of the infrastructure is really important in order for the people and the people who are not using the, the bike lanes or the bike infrastructure to understand that that's not their place. That's not their space. You're telling me that you're having lots of problems of people 
parking on the bike lanes. Well, I would take a look at the separator that you're using. I mean, we developed sort of a really good know-how what works and what doesn't work. So uh, in order to make people understand and to make a good use of that infrastructure, that new, you always have to think that it's a new infrastructure in many places. You have to uh, implement a really good design. And that's really important. And also about education. We uh, experienced the power of the infrastructure in order to make it an object for the education, a tool for the education. I mean, we, you know, on that master plan, uh, we had we had a, a worry back then. Okay, what 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 happens if we build eighty kilometers of bike network and nobody's going to use it? So we try to get lots of uh, programs about education and getting bikes or or cycling a culture into the working spaces or the working places, you know, to uh, to communication strategies and all that. But they were not necessary. I mean, the infrastructure, the power of the infrastructure and having something in your urban space was so big also to develop education that we did not need all those programs that we were thinking of uh, like a sort of a plan B if we didn't uh, have the, all, that many uh, cyclists. So I would say if you get a whole network in just one and a half years, I mean, you're, it, that's going to educate. <laughs> well, it's not only the drivers who cause problems when it comes to interacting with bikes, but we also have some cyclists who don't obey the rules of the road either. They might, um, you know, speed through a red light when they really shouldn't, or they may be going too fast and impeding the progress of slower cyclists. So what has gone on in that arena? Do you have a problem with cyclists who aren't obeying the rules? And what have you done about that? Yeah, well, I've got to tell you two things here, two issues that I think they're really important. First of all, what I told you, design. I mean, if the, if the bike lane is not wide enough, you're going to have problems with people that are cycling different speeds. So you have to think about that. If, or what are you connecting? If, if it's going to be people who need to maybe make 10 or 15 miles in order to go to work, to use the bike, they're gonna go fast. So if, 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 if your situation is that, you need more space, you, have, you need to widen that, that infrastructure. So the first, first of all, the first idea is the same as the uh, last question, design. The second is uh, more complex. I think we're, when we are talking about cyclists that do not follow the lights or do not follow the signals, you know, we've been um, organizing the whole mobility at the urban space for cars for the last century. So we are trying to fit people that actually do not fit on that legal framework because they are cycling, they are not drivers. I don't know if, I, if, if uh, it's understandable what I'm saying. You know, we are, uh, there are uh, situations where Traffic rules do not apply for cyclists because they've been thought for cars. So that's part of the uh, discussion and the reflection about the legal framework that I talked about in the presentation. I mean, we are trying to apply rules for bike that they are not really useful. For example, in Paris right now, they've been doing lots of cycling improvements in the last years, there, there's a stick in the uh, traffic lights that it says, if you're cycling and it's red, for you, that means it's a yield. You know what I mean? So they're adapting the traffic uh, uh, rules and the legal framework for traffic and for mobility for cycling. And I think that's really important. And if you do that, you will have less people uh, you know, jumping up the rules and not following the rules. 
just to kind of drill down a little bit more on infrastructure and some of the safeguards you've put in place, one of the questions we have from the audience, uh, can you speak to the rationale of putting bike lanes at sidewalk level and what are some of the pros and cons of that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, well the, this uh, mm, decision was based in two things. The first one is that the perceived, well, you have to understand that you're making or you're building or you're having cycling infrastructure to get people cycling that actually are not cyclists. So, as I told you, as I told the people uh, showing the images, normal people, normal, you know, people that actually do not use a bike. You want them. You want them to get uh, on top of a bike. So we decided to put it at sidewalk level because we knew that the perceived security or safety of those new cyclists were gonna, uh, was going to uh, be higher uh, if you uh, ride on a sidewalk level because you have the curb in order to protect you from the, from the traffic. The second reason is that was political. As you can see, we had lots of backlash and we uh, fear at that moment that the local government uh, could change at any moment. And actually it did change in, in 2011. So uh, when you widen the sidewalk, you have to build a new sidewalk in order to place the bike uh, lane on top. If there was a local government not supportive for cycling, in order to get rid of that infrastructure, it had to get rid of the whole platform or sidewalk. That was really difficult. <laughs> if you just take a space of the road and put a separator on a parking lane, to get rid of that is just the night. So it was a political reason also of a political strategy in order to get that on sidewalk level. Right now, what's happening? All the new bike lanes are being placed at road level because nobody, not even the conservatives or the local governments or anyone in the city right now discusses the, important, the importance of having cycling infrastructure. So there's no worries right now of getting of you know local government getting rid of cycling infrastructure because they might go even by bike to work. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was watching one of your videos earlier and it talked about you want to put something in that's sort of hardened in a way so you just can't uh, say maybe if you just put some paint down another administration could come in and just rip all that up. Mm -hmm. But when you kind of, you know, harden things in the system, it would be hard to do that and it just becomes more of a permanent fixture. Yeah, Gail, and if, you know, a local government wanted to get rid of that space for cycling, uh, since it's on a sidewalk level, it would go to the pedestrians. Even in that situation, you know. Yeah, another thing I wanted to... Um... Gail, you turned off your, uh, your microphone. Okay, here we go. <laughs> yeah, another um, big controversy here in Houston that we see is when you want to put bike infrastructure through neighborhoods. And these are neighborhoods where people may depend on on-street parking, especially when they're having someone over to their house. So what kind of situations did you run into in neighborhoods where you wanted to put in more bike infrastructure and possibly take away parking? And, and how were you able to work through that? Well, uh, there were a, hunch, but a whole bunch of uh, different situations here, uh, you know, local situations and that. What we are applying now from a sustainable mobility point of view, it's that you have to uh, sort of manage the uh, parking spaces that you have. Uh, what I'm advising to many cities right now, if you're, going, if you're going to a neighborhood and you get rid of parking spaces, the parking spaces that are left, you have to save them for the, uh, for the residents. Hmm? So it's not the same actually a parking space for residents or a parking space for for a rotation space, what we call it in Spanish, rotatorio, no? We call it Spanish rotatorio. In English, I think it's a rotation space. It's not the same, actually, uh, from a management point of view, a urban space management point of view. So what I'm advising many cities right now is to, okay, if you have a hundred parking spaces in a neighborhood and you get a, you're gonna get rid of 
50 for a bike infrastructure, the other 50 should be saved for the residents. And uh, if you do that, suddenly the uh, people from that neighborhood, the neighbors just uh, get really supportive to get that bike infrastructure <laughs> because they're also getting uh, uh, you know, uh, parking spaces for them. One thing people in here in Houston are really curious about, and here in May, we're in our last few days of the season before it gets extremely hot. So this is kind of the last little bit of springtime where it's pleasant to get out and ride a bike. Does cycling drop in the summer in Seville when temperatures get warm? Uh, how much temperature are you talking about, Gail, in, there in Houston? Uh, we have days where it easily soars up to 100 degrees. To 100 degrees. Well, yes. here in Spain, in, in Seville, yeah, here in Spain, right now, today, we're having more of that temperature. So it's an extremely hot uh, place also in summertime. We are getting days with 120 and 115, mm. their usual days here in, in summertime. If, uh, everything, uh, of course, the uh, cycling mobility goes down. It goes down all the activity in the city, <laughs> mm. actually. Here uh, uh, in August, just people go to the beach or whatever. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the city uh, closes down most of it. So, uh, but, you know, it's impressive. And it's impressive even for me. Yesterday, you know, you see people cycling around with 40 degrees Celsius <laughs> and 38 degrees Celsius. I don't know how much that in Fahrenheit is, but uh, it's a lot. So uh, people still use the bike because when you, you get used to, get, uh, to, to use the bike as a tool, it's very difficult to get rid of it because it's so comfortable and so useful that even if it's hot, you still use it. One of the big overriding questions that some of our participants were asking about this afternoon is, where do you get the money to do all this? Here in Houston, we do have a bike plan, but funding comes from all sorts of different sources. It comes from grants, it comes from different governmental entities. So you just don't have this big, huge pool of money coming directly from the city to go into it. So what were some of the funding challenges and basically where did you get the money from to fund all this? Well, the first phase were the money, we got them from the urban development. The second phase was uh, a program uh, coming from the central government, from the national government, in order to tackle the financial crisis in 2010. And after that, we've, we've been uh, going slow. But Gail, you know, I'm a transportation consultant, not just cycling transportation consultant. And the order of magnitude of investment for cycling infrastructure does not nothing, it's not nothing comparable with the road infrastructure. I mean, we are talking that a kilometer of highway here, two lane and two lane here in Spain, uh, it's say, 6 million euros per kilometer. And a bike track or a bike lane, it, maybe it's 200,000. So we're talking of more than a, an order of magnitude. And the return of that infrastructure is so great when you're talking about cycling, that actually when you're building cycling infrastructure, the government or the country is actually earning money. And, it, and it's earning that money really fast. I mean, the recovery uh, of that investment is so fast. So actually, it's not a huge uh, bunch of money that you need to uh, build uh, sunny infrastructure. I mean, there's nothing comparable with road space or road uh, infrastructure, nothing comparable. I mean, it's not, it's not an issue having the funds. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure you had a certain amount of naysayers when you were putting all this work together who said, no, you know, this is never gonna work. For a car city, people drive, that's just the way it is, never gonna work. And we have a lot of that attitude here in Houston, um, you know, especially people out on the fringes of the city who drive quite a bit. And they say, no, 
people don't ride bikes here in Houston. That's just not what we do. And this is never going to work. So what do you say to people who just sort of throw up their hands and say, well, there's nothing we can do. And that's just the way it is. Well, it, it, that's an excuse. I mean, that's not the reality. You know, the backlash that, that we uh, faced uh, back then, uh, one of the arguments were, okay, we are not blondies and have blue eyes like the uh, people from the Netherlands, you know? We like to drive our Mercedes uh, just in front of the door. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we built the infrastructure and just people started cycling. We're still not blondies. <laughs> now we have the blue eyes. Uh, so, I mean, th that's an excuse that does not happen. You know, I've been in, in meetings uh, with people from Cordoba or Huelva or Cadiz, or, uh, cities that are really near Seville, maybe a hundred kilometers uh, uh, far from Seville. And they tell me after that, uh, after what happened, they tell me, okay, meanwhile, you know, the people from Seville, you guys have another culture. <laughs> you know, you do ride bikes, but that's not going to work here in Cordoba or in Cadiz or in Huelva, because you, you guys are like more urban, are more modern, and you have another culture. I mean, they're talking about us the same way that we talked about the people from the Netherlands or from Amsterdam and from Cabe Hangen, you know, that's an excuse. So it, I, I would... I would not give more importance to those arguments. I mean, they're not important because they're not real. They're a myth. Well, in the few minutes we have left, Manuel, there's some wonderful videos on YouTube where you can see some of the infrastructure in Seville and the way people use that infrastructure. Um, what are some resources people can go to to learn more about what is going on in Seville and some of your other work? And, what's happening with bike infrastructure going forward? Well, there are, uh, uh, we've been uh, publishing some works uh, with the university on, on, on papers on, and journals, and scientific journals that, you know, where we explain all this process on a technical and a proper way. Uh, but, you know, YouTube, it's a really good uh, way uh, to, to know how, to, how, to, how we did that and, and where we explain, as you said, how we did that. Uh, here you have my email on the presentation. So you can always uh, ask me directly. I would be more than happy to answer any queries that people might have. And um, even having said uh, this, uh, you have to understand that people, uh, I mean, Seville is not Amsterdam, okay? It's not Copenhagen, it's not Utrecht. It's nothing uh, compared to that. Mm -hmm in cycling mobility. But I think the, uh, one of the, uh, the, uh, the important issues here in Seville, uh, as I explained, is that how you can start to have something. I mean, uh, lots of people go that does not have anything in their cities, go directly to Amsterdam and they get overwhelmed of what's happening there because they don't, do not know how to go from zero to 35% of model sharing by bike. What we did is going from zero to six, and that's a starting point. And we're trying to manage to 15, and that's like a second phase. And then we are going to improve more and more, I guess, in the coming years. So uh, I think that that's a good idea that you could find, of course, in all those sources, mm -hmm. because you're not gonna get, for example, if you, type cycling Amsterdam and cycling Seville, it's not gonna be the same, okay? But you're gonna have something in Seville. And that's, I think, the most important step here in the whole process, to go from zero to 6%. Once you get 6%, all the discussions and all the debates get more, 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 and easier, 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 easier. Well, Manuel, thank you very much for your time this evening. We appreciate your insights, and I'm sure a lot of people will be reaching out to you as we work to develop our bike infrastructure here in Houston. Thank you very much for spending some time with us today. Thanks to you, Gail. Thanks to Joe. Uh, thanks to, uh, to the people from Houston and from everywhere in the U.S. 
I'm as always really pleased to share my experiences with you guys and happy to work together for a more sustainable world. Thanks a lot. Muchas gracias. And Joe, we'll throw it back to you. Thank you, Gail, and thank you so much, Manuel. That was fantastic. Um, it's it's really interesting to me to hear you say, you know, we're not Amsterdam. Um, you know, Houston is not Austin. You know, Houston is not San Francisco. Houston is not New York. Houston is not all the other American cities that have done, you know, really good work around bike infrastructure. So to hear you say that Seville is not you know, Amsterdam, which, you know, no city can really come close to Amsterdam, except maybe Utrecht, Copenhagen, and a handful of others. But still, um, you know, the fact that you're so modest about this um, is, <laughs> uh, it's a little bit funny to me, given given what you've accomplished. But, um, you know, I would love for, you know, the people here today, and I know there's a lot of planners in this room, and a lot of decision makers, and some pretty influential influential people in this room watching and listening to what you've had to say today. Um, and I think we have a lot of lessons to learn about um, what you've done, especially this concept that we need to build a network, not just build a bike lane here, a bike lane there, uh, and hope it comes together someday. We really do need a connected network. Yeah, um, make it fast, Joe. And to do it fast, exactly. We can't do this, you know, one mile per make year. Make it happen as fast as possible, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and, and Bike Houston is, is ready to support our local government and all the other proponents who build bike lanes around here. You know, we're ready to give you all the tailwind you need. So shifting gears, I just want to say thank you to Manuel, to Gail, to Link Houston, to B-Cycle, to our sponsors. And I just, you know, if you've been to any other sessions here at the Houston Bike Summit, you, you've heard this from others, and I just want to reiterate it. Um, we're providing uh, all this content free of charge. And if you found value in what you heard here today, and if you've attended other sessions, if you plan to join uh, tomorrow's keynote with uh, Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo, and if you plan to join uh, Tuesday's session uh, on the bike infrastructure that's in the works, I hope you'll consider becoming a Bike Houston member or make a donation to Bike Houston. We're at bikehouston.org and you'll find the links there. Thank you so much. Thanks.